teaching the hands. So I went upstairs and just read a little deal off here quickly on, uh, on teaching the hands and the hands technique uh, on a line of scrimmage. I, th I think there's some things that, uh, that we think are important with doing that. And obviously, uh, the first consideration on any technique on a line of scrimmage defensively, I think, is uh, the ability for the defensive player to be able to do something uh, to nullify the advantage the offensive player has in a neutral zone. And that has, obviously, uh, the thing that can get there the quickest and the thing there that can get there in terms of traveling distance the fastest is the hands. And uh, uh, with that technique on a line of scrimmage, I think uh, uh, the defensive player has the ability to be able to control that area, not to act in a defensive mode and catch it, but to be able to control that area. So uh, when we start talking about the hands, uh, we talk about quickness and all the movement of the hands and arms is forward. Uh, there can be no hitching with the hands and I, I like to liken it to a six inch jab. You know, when you start to think about uh, that distance and area that we're trying to control as defensive players, uh, the quicker we get there, the less momentum the offensive player has coming off the football at us. And uh, uh, the more you wind up and hitch, uh, the more momentum the offensive player has coming off the line of scrimmage. And uh, so it's much like a six inch jab with the fighter. You know, while the fighter is winding up to land a haymaker, he's got one on his chin from the other guy. And the same is true when you talk about using the hands uh, in terms of all the movement of the hands and arms is forward and uh, thereby getting the offensive player before he gains distance towards you. And I, I think that's a critical area. And uh, so that the blow now is struck with the palms and heels of the hands. And I, I don't think it makes any difference to th thumbs up or uh, where they are exactly. I, guys use hands differently and guys' anatomy at the elbow and at the uh, shoulders is different. So to always say that the thumbs need to be up. In fact, I, I have seen a lot of guys who uh, insist on players you, having the thumbs up and as a result, the hands come in this arc as opposed to this arc. And I think there's some danger in that because the hands want to work inside out to the tips of the numbers. That's basically where you're looking for an aiming point when you do strike the blow with the palms and heels of the hands. Uh, the hands want to work inside out on, on, on the offensive player. You know, one thing about the blow, it's adjustable. If you take a defensive player and put him in a stance, and then if he knows what he's doing using his hands, that blow is adjustable all the way from the point where the hand is on the ground and the left arm is ready to use, hanging there, uh, all the way through the arc, through the offensive player. Now when you start talking about forearm blows and those kinds of things, now you start to talk about a differential in distance in the ground, uh, from the ground to the area where the, the offensive player, for example, on a scramble block would make uh, contact with you. So the aiming point uh, really is, is, the out, is the outside tips of the numbers on the offensive player's jersey, and which is the area under the shoulder pads. Uh, but it's adjustable. It may very well go uh, to the helmet or to the shoulder pads uh, in, in terms of a scramble block, all the way to the blocker who is relatively high where you can get the good fit uh, underneath the pads. Uh, as the blow is struck, the player wants to work to lock out. Now, if he doesn't, all he, the only strength that he has really is in his biceps. And so what he's trying to do when he locks out uh, is he tries to involve the muscles uh, of the back, the bigger muscles. We want bigger muscle involvement. Uh, and the thing that we want to be sure of as we strike the blow is we want to keep our head and eyes uh, at a constant level. Now, the thing that we try to do uh, in teaching this is, is to try to make sure that we can isolate phases of this uh, technique. And, and with doing that, we're trying to 
uh, take the legs and the feet and the, and the rest of the body out as much as we can, and that's why with our phases we put a guy uh, on the knees to start with. Uh, again, we don't want to compromise our shoulder level because what we're trying to get is leverage. And when we start talking about leverage, we talk about we as defensive players having more big muscle involvement than the offensive player. And when you're talking about that, then there's some real easy, uh, I think, uh, measuring points for a defensive player. And, and one is shoulder level lower than the offensive player. The other is face mask or, 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 uh, or uh, face or head and eyes lower than the offensive player. And usually, if that's the case, then you'll have a defensive player with better leverage uh, or strength than, and more big muscle involvement than the offensive player. We try to stay away from stretching your strength out too much. Uh, now, the strength of the blow itself will come from two things. One is the quickness with which the blow is struck, and the other is from the big muscle involvement. Now, when you start to look at the phases of that, we already talked about the hands and, and the ability to be able to lock out and then involve the big muscles of the back. And then the rest of it involves the ability to be able to roll the hips or involve the bigger muscles of the lower body. Now, I got some bad drawings here, but uh, what I'm trying to show here is, is what we're trying to get in the way of the first phase of the teaching. Now, whether it's on a sled, we've done it on a wall, we've done it on the side of a gym, mats hanging on a gym, whatever. Uh, this technique is, you can teach it anywhere, at a garage, uh, try to stay away from knocking the plaster down, but you, there's a lot of ways to be able to teach this technique in terms of, of, of having available uh, any kind of a surface where a guy can use the hands. But the first phase that we're talking about is to put a player on his knees, and, and you want to be able to, first of all, have him get a fit or get a feel for what that all feels like uh, and what we're trying to accomplish. So we get a guy uh, with his hands extended, and if we got a, a Rogers sled or any kind of a pad or even a wall, like we said, what we try to do is to get that guy to get the feel of uh, the strength that he gets and the, where we want his hands by uh, locking out at the elbow so that he can feel the strength uh, and the big muscles of the back involved in the process. And so after we've, he gets a good fit, then the coach gets a ball, and we do everything defensively with the line on movement, and what we want to do is we want, on the movement, we want that guy uh, to drive those hands to that point inside out at the tips of the numbers. Strike the blow with the palms and heels of the hands. Don't change the elevation of the head. And, and get the feel then uh, of actually pushing on that thing after he gets it there. We don't want him to slap it, because that's not what we're after. What we're after is to get underneath the pads of that guy and take him back, knock him back uh, on the other side of the line of scrimmage. So it's crucial that he gets the feel for that. And again, uh, we, we, we are not in the process at that point of doing anything with the rest of the body or doing anything with the feet. Now, uh, and, and they can do this a lot every day, and we do it with our guys at the Packers. We did it every place I've coached in the NFL in terms of teaching the hands, and those pro guys, Reggie White and all the rest of them, got their, they're on their knees, and, and we start the phases every, t every day we work on the hands that way. Now, after we've worked on that process for a while, then we want to add a little bit to it. We want to feel him, him to feel after he strikes the blow, that full extension, and then the feel of just rolling his hips in. And he can feel the involvement of the big muscles by just rolling the hips in after he struck the blow, blow without compromising uh, uh, that uh, head and eye level as far as his target's concerned. Now, after he's done that for a while, then we'll get him up. Boy, he used to do this a lot easier. But uh, then uh, we'll get him in a stance. And then, uh, again, keeping the feet out of the process, we get the movement again, and then we want to strike the blow on the movement and leave the feet there. Don't worry about the feet. They might fall on their face if they really hit the sled. That's good. We don't want to, to worry again about the feet because, again, we want to emphasize and have that player understand that we're not talking about stepping and striking simultaneously. We're talking about going and getting them with the hands and then bring the feet with you. And so, again, after we have done that a while, 
then we will end it the way we want to play football. That is, we will strike, then we'll bring the foot, uh, and if we're on the left side, we'd like to end up playing with our inside leg up, our outside leg back or free. And if we're playing on the right side of our defense, the same thing is true. And again, like we said, we'd like to have all left-handed kids playing because it's natural for him to take that step. But if we don't have it and the kid's not natural, then he'll strike that blow, take a step with his back foot, but then quickly take another jab step to square himself back up. So he'll play with a step and a shuffle. If he's on the right-hand side, playing uh, in a right-handed stance. And again, I think that uh, there's no better way to teach defensive linemen how to play on a line of scrimmage than to put them on their knees and go through those phases with them. Now, uh, after they get aware of that, then we take offensive or defensive players and, and uh, line them up one against the other one and then uh, try to get the, and give them a nice target and take an offensive, make one of them an offensive player and he just kind of in a stance about like this. The other guy's in a stance and he drives and gets his hands in that position, works to lock out, uh, involves the big muscles and just takes the offensive player back a couple of steps just so he feels that power base of having a better leverage position in the guy, uh, working it out to involve the back, and getting the big muscles involved in the process. That's, a, I think, a, a good way to do it. And then uh, the next phase of that is to have two defensive players, one, and off, and one is going to be an offensive guy, they're both in a stance, and the offensive guy comes off high uh, but out of a stance, and the defensive guy does the same thing with the hand placement and gets him back. And then the next phase of that is to involve a, a ball carrier behind the offensive player and then do that on a line so that uh, uh, you got an offensive guy and a defensive guy. A defensive guy comes off the ball, knocks him back, and then the ball carrier comes and then on the shed or the release off the block, use the momentum of throwing the blocker to go up the field to reduce the angle that the back has to whichever side he makes a cut off of that offensive blocker. But again, everything that's involved is the process of reducing the angle the offensive player has as he attacks the line of scrimmage. And again, the actual ability to be able to drive those hands in there and then get a hold of that blocker and shed him and move up the field is a critical part of that whole process. Now, uh, before we move on here to the uh, front we were talking about, one other thing about the, the hands and the pass rush, because it's hard to not talk about the pass rush when you talk about the hands. I, I think there's a couple of things involved. Uh, there ain't any question, but what two things are apparent and have been to me over the years. One is that the involvement of the hands in some form of push, pull, and turn is really what pass rush is all about. Uh, and the best pass rushers I know are guys who can maintain somewhat of a parallel relationship with the line of scrimmage up the field and force the offensive player to turn some way, either out of his stance or as the player attacks him or works to the corner of the blocker. So that squared up relationship, the push, pull, and turn and utilization of the hands, and then uh, the ability to be able to uh, turn the blocker or get to the corner of the blocker is crucial. Now, with that in mind, if those are in fact truisms about pass rushing, then the best place to rush the passer is to establish a position on the corner of the blocker to begin with. There's no question about that. Uh, so that if you're going to be an effective pass rusher over the corner of a blocker, then your best bet is to line up on the corner of the blocker. Now, which means that if you're a two-gapper uh, and you're attacking the blocker in a two-gap mode or from a head-up position, then the first thing you've got to be able to do is to get that guy turned or get on the corner of that blocker from that position. Now, I think there's a couple of things involved there. One of them is takeoff. That's why takeoff is so critical in the pass rush. But, you know, when you start talking about ta takeoff and pass rush, I think you can look at pass rushers in a, in in the first two steps and tell what kind of a pass rusher they really are. Uh, because if you say to a lot of football players, even in our league, many, many in our league, if you say run, 
he comes off the ball like this. If you say pass, he's up here. Now, the thing about it, if they really understand what's going on, the thing about pass rush, and, and most of the time what you get is a relatively soft set from linemen, even the firm setters are gonna move a little bit or be in a position to be supple and loose to the point where there's a little bit of movement back. That guy's gotta remember that what's happening there with that guy is he's establishing for himself a new line of scrimmage. So if you don't wanna be up in the air playing a guy in a running game on line of scrimmage, you sure as hell don't wanna be up in the air when you're back playing off of this guy when he's sitting back. So that has to do with elevation and with gaining distance up the field off the takeoff as you come off the football. And then the ability to be able to, for example, get that same kind of hand placement on this guy as a pass protector sitting back that you would get if he were run blocking you on a line of scrimmage. So that all has to do with that line of force or elevation as you come off the football. Those are critical issues in, the, in, in that basic part of the thing that we call pass rush. Now, there's one other thing involved, I think, that became apparent to me after a, a few years in this business. One is that you want to have your feet pointed towards the passer. Now, so that's easy if I'm a uh, bull rusher rushing over the top of an offensive guard straight ahead. There's the passer, here I come, there's my feet. Where it really becomes crucial and important, I think, is when you're rushing up the field on the outside. And the, the point is this, and you, you can visualize it here, and then I think I might be able to demonstrate it. But well, we see a lot of three and five step drops and we don't see many times when the quarterback is operating back there. Uh, when as an outside rusher, the route to that guy has been in the past one where he can rip and rub it tight. And it can happen a little bit sometimes yet. But basically what happens is if that quarterback steps up and that guy keeps ripping with, if I keep ripping with my inside arm, the offensive lineman just kind of rides me on by and I'm never a factor. Now, if I get to that point, however, and the quarterback steps up here, and I'm at that position where I'm rushing over the outside, and I think about getting my feet pointed back at that quarterback, then I might think about, as that guy is pushing me at this point, reaching around with my outside arm for that quarterback who now has stepped up there and get my feet pointed back downfield. Now I'm a factor on a rush on that guy. On the football, I'm a factor on a rush on that guy in terms of if he turns back my way. But if I continue to work uh, with my feet pointed away from him, then that offensive player just kind of rides me away. And so those, I think, are crucial issues about the hands and the feet as far as the pass rush is concerned. Anybody have any question about that? About what we're saying? Okay. All right, over and under defense now. Uh, we're talking about basically uh, some alignments that, that we use that are part of what we do. And uh, I've got a little box on this guy here because it doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, this can be a defensive end in a four down lineman scheme or it might be a linebacker who's flopped if you're going to use a, a scheme that would involve one, two, uh, three, four linebackers. Now, uh, with us that happens to be a defensive end. Now, in the over and under scheme of things, uh, what we're really talking about is some constant positions. Uh, either an offset or a two-gap nose. That's the same in both of these defenses. The only difference is, in the under defense, he's offset to the strong side of the formation, and an A-gap player on that side. Uh, in the over defense, he's offset to the weak side of the formation, and an A-gap player there. The other position that's constant, only on the opposite side, is the three-technique player, or the tackle. That guy is the same guy on both sides of the formation. Now, if you're in a four down line scheme like we are, uh, this player is the same guy. In other words, the defensive end, uh, when we're in our under defense, he's playing in a six technique most of the time, a five occasionally. And then when we go to the over defense, he just kicks out and he's in a nine most of the time, 
or in an outside shade. Uh, occasionally head up, don't like that, tell you why we don't like that very much. And uh, so uh, we play, everybody stays on the same side. Now, if this guy is a linebacker in that scheme, then he flops so that if we're in the under scheme, he's outside on the open side or the weak side of the formation, and our true defensive end is sitting over here on this side, and then when he comes over here in the over defense, the other end goes to the other side. So uh, those are some things that are, are kind of, uh, uh, you make a decision as what kind of player you got and then use it the same way. But the basic philosophy of these two defensive schemes are the same uh, in terms of the utilization of personnel. And the only thing that you may pick up occasionally is the ability to be able to use this guy as a pass dropper, but uh, uh, most people who use that guy in that position don't drop him very much. Uh, we didn't when we were in that position. Now, as far as the linebackers are concerned, the Mike linebacker or the inside linebacker is the same guy. He's the guy who's making the adjustment from the uh, strong side to formation in the under to the weak side uh, in the over defense. Uh, our plugger is the guy who flops sides uh, in the under defense. He's a weak side or flex side player, and over he's a solid side or a strong side player in the over defense. Our buck linebacker is this guy here, and in the, in the uh, under defense, the buck linebacker is a, over the tight end, a strong side player. Uh, in our over defense, he's some kind of a weak side player. Now advantages of the two. There ain't any question but what one of the limitations of this defense here is the fact that you are limited coverage wise because you don't have the ability to have him as a convenient flat dropper uh, uh, when you're in this defense. When he's here you can use him for any kind of a pass drop you want because he's equipped to do it, he's aligned to do it. Whereas this player, the plugger here, is more of an inside player and it requires adjustments that, have to, that cause him to have to work to the outside to be able to use all of his cover down principles and all those kinds of things. So there's a limitation coverage wise. The advantage without question of these defense is the ability to have the defensive end over a tight end. We, we think we should never lose that battle. Disadvantage again of the over front is it's kind of like when you got a great corner. If somebody asked me, would you rather have a great defensive end or a great tackle? I say great tackle. If you say, would you rather have a great corner or a great safety? I say safety based on very simple mathematics. You can take a great corner out of a ball game, never throw at him, never run at him. You can take a great defensive end out of a ball game. Run away from him. Now, a tackle moves in a little closer, whether you're talking about running away from him and then trying to cut back. All of those kinds of things we talked about, about reducing angles, become more prevalent there in that situation. And the same is true with a safety. You know, you can get a safety up there close to the line inside, play an eight-man front, use a great player in there, instinctive player and all that. The corner sits outside and is out of the game. So my point is this, in an over defense, if you try to get the advantage of having him over the tight end, you may never see any runs over there. So that's one of the disadvantages of the, of the uh, over defense, along with the limitations of coverage. And then the adjustments to the strong side because that plugger linebacker is lined up inside. Now, one of the advantages of this front, and we did it more and more this year, is the ability to move to an even defense from it and play all the same coverages. Uh, this is an advantage for us and, and, and gives us the ability to be able to change that inside front up and to be able to change the looks up in there. And uh, one of the things that we do a little of is we go to a, a stack defense some, and so uh, moving the nose to that side of the formation and lining up in an even, we retain the same ability to be able to do both of those things. So uh, in this scheme, the one thing that I think is, is uh, is good about it is once a guy learns to play the offset nose technique, he knows it, so he plays either side. Once the guy learns to play the three technique, he knows it, he plays either side. 
and, and that gives you the ability to be able to do uh, some things that an offensive team has to get ready for. And there are an awful lot of people in the National Football League who play those two fronts, just those two fronts, the over and the under front, and uh, are pretty good at it. Uh, and I think uh, one thing that uh, we need to talk about some is, is this guy in this position uh, and, and this guy in this position and what we expect out of him. So uh, this is the way that the, this defense looks for us in terms of basic gap responsibilities uh, in the under defense. Depending on whether or not we have force outside him, this is the way that it looks. Now, with our nose tackle now, uh, he's a zero strong side player. That means he's an A-gap player on all runs. He's an A-gap defender on all runs to the strong side of the formation. On all runs away from him, he's got to squeeze uh, the flex side or the weak side A-gap. Uh, our tackle is a, a, as a three technique player is basically a B-gap player. His responsibility is the same way. To knock him back, his hand placement, the same as if he were a two-gap player there, and his job is to maintain the B-gap, his side the formation, all weak side or flex side runs, and then squeeze uh, the uh, A-gap to that side of the formation, and he's not ever going across this guy's face and compromise the responsibility of the backer on that side of the formation. So he's playing a three technique all the time, except uh, when the plugger's gonna move outside, then he may become a two-gap player for us. We'll go over that. Now, the strong side end, the strong side of the formation is playing a six technique, there are times in when people line up in weak side running formations without a lot of threat to the backside where we will play him in a five technique on that side, knock him back, and then be in a position by knocking him back to be able to secure that backside B gap. The buck linebacker, we line up in a nine. Now we line up in a nine with him for a lot of reasons. One of them is that we don't like to have to play so much what we call an easy block on the backside of the formation where this guy can fan it outside and he doesn't know whether or not he's getting reached or he in fact is releasing outside and then we're going to get some kind of a block from the inside out and all that. We would much rather line him up in a tight nine in there and let him attack that guy from this point and get his good pass run reach, play coverage from there and do all those kinds of things. So he's in a nine a lot more than he's in an eight. He's in an eight for us in those situations where we're playing a two deep coverage, we want to play heavy on a tight end, then in that situation he would be up in there uh, playing an eight. Uh, our Mike linebacker is going to be in a two alignment, which is about three and a half yards off the football and nose up on the guard, keying through the guard uh, to the near back in the formation. And the reason he's lined up in that position is to give him the ability to be able to get to his front side gap responsibilities on runs to the flex side of the formation and the ability to be able to hit a good downhill uh, read on direct reads to this side of the formation and to play inside out on fast reads to the, the, the strong side of the formation. So uh, that's why he's where he is. Our plugger uh, on the back side of the formation is in a six technique most of the time except on those uh, run formations when we think we can cheat him to the strong side then he's lined up in a five. The critical situation in terms of his alignment is that we say whenever they're in any kind of a weak set where there's a threat of uh, a downhill run to his side the formation, he's got to be in a position by his alignment to take all blockers on with his inside pad. He can't be in any kind of a cheat position there or nose up or head up position because what happens then is he compromises the angle that he attacks the line of scrimmage which destroys the symmetry of the gap controls on that side of the formation. So he's got to be, think in terms of, again, of those, all those things we talked about, angles, when that back is there and we have the threat of that kind of a block, that kind of a lead, he's got to be able to compress or squeeze as he takes that on with his inside pad. And that's, that's very important to us, uh, wherever he lines up. Now, uh, with our weekend, 
On the outside the formation, whenever somebody gives us an open side to formation, we want to, as much as we have, can have him to be a hard upfield player. Now, as we said, over there on that side of the formation, uh, we're going to try to keep him out of force as much as we can, and we're going to play as much crash and scrape as we can. That is, he's coming, his aiming point is, is for the near hip or the near back, if they attack, if he is attacked in all but man dogs and blitzes, he's going to play two gap the inside on him, and we're going to scrape that linebacker to this point. Now, if he gets a block out on that side of formation, now that all changes for the plugger and him. Now he's going to squeeze it with his inside pad. Now he's going to take any blocker that's coming on with his uh, inside pad and squeeze it back to the three technique, who's the B gap player on that side of formation. Now, uh, our weak side end, uh, uh, in terms of uh, two gap, may end up in a situation whenever the plugger, because of, of coverage on his side, the formation has to get in a cover down look or an outside look, gives these guys a call, and now they're two gap players. Now, uh, for a lot of years uh, there at the Packers, uh, these guys, uh, whenever this plugger moved outside, uh, would go to the inside gap. And really what we're trying to do is to protect against cutback run to the strong side to formation when he's removed. Because he's an A-gap player on plays away. That's his gap. Well, if he's removed, obviously somebody else has got to have it. And uh, the way that for a lot of years people did that was to commit him to the gap right now. And, and we don't think that's necessary at all. We'll stay in our normal alignment, and then we're going to come there and two-gap those guys. So that if run shows away, he becomes responsible for the A gap, he responsible for the B gap, and then we'll make him bounce that play all the way back out to the outside where we got the plugger there as a player. And so when we make that cover down adjustment on the weak side of the formation, it does allow us to be able to be in a situation where we're solid there and, and we're not just giving up one for one with those guys. Now, over on the strong side of the under defense, there are times when by coverage, we need to cover down this backer. We need to get him outside there. And when we do that, then this defensive end is put in a seven. And now we, that's the situation where we move our, our Mike linebacker from a two technique player to a three technique player. And that puts us in a position to be able to, to make the adjustment to the strong side of the formation adjust for the fact that we have removed him or covered down to the strong side of the formation. Now. Uh, again, uh, we don't change much of that. And the only thing that we change some here is that uh, we do need to be able to at times make the adjustment with the gap control here uh, between our nose and our mic linebacker. And we will play, make a, a, a jam call here now and then where he'll move to a two gap on it and he becomes the front side player on any weak side runs. And that lets that mic linebacker hang backside uh, a little more and put in that position to be able to, to play those gaps. But any under defense for us, there's a couple of things. We've got to win the battle over the tight end. That's crucial for us. The guy uh, has got to be a real active player on the weak side of the formation where we got a chance to get up the field with him. And then uh, uh, from then on, everybody else is a downhill aggressive player. Now, when we go to the over defense now, these guys are the same. The only difference is uh, he's a, uh, a strong side B gap player with a three technique. He's offset to the weak side the formation. And now our defensive end is playing the nine on that side, the formation. Now, the thing that we need to be able to handle like everybody does in this defense, and the thing that's, that's really prevalent is we need to be able to handle this blocking scheme here. Everybody's doing it, blocking them down, trying to turn this defensive end out, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, we also need to, with this defense, be able to, as much as we can, get this guy out of this position. We don't like that. Uh, that position is a tough position for a guy who's basically an upfield guy, not a 300 pounder like those other guys are. And as a result, uh, we look for opportunities to be able to cheat this alignment some where we can kick this defensive end outside in the position he plays best, 
kick him back to the inside here and then put him in this cheat whenever we're in formations that will allow us to be able to, with strong flood sets, play to the strong side the formation and get this linebacker in a position uh, where we can pick him up so that the gap control is this way, this way, and this way, as opposed to him having to come off of a two gap when maybe he's not the same kind of physical player we would like to be have lined up in that position. Now, so the, the nose is a zero weak player. We may change that up with a, the jam call some where we're going to two gap in there, bring him to the front side, and he's a downhill player. Then on the back side, the formation, they just switch gaps uh, by call in that situation. Uh, the three technique is the same. The weak end is in a five, and uh, we'd like to get him out of that position, like I said, as much as we possibly can because of the kind of player he is in that position. And then uh, uh, with the rest of it, the buck linebacker is playing in, either in the hip position when he's in the five, on the line of scrimmage when he's in a cover down because there's another tight end in the game, uh, or uh, in the cheat position inside. Those are the three positions that that linebacker plays on that side of the formation. Uh, again, now with our plugger. Uh, he, like when he's over on this side, the formation, uh, has to be in a position to be able to take all of these blockers on with his inside pad at a good angle and compress or squeeze off the down block from the tackle in that situation. That's important, and that's a crucial part of what we need to be able to do uh, over there on that side, the formation with him. And obviously, we think that this guy's got to win all the time uh, whenever he's lined up over a tight end. If they elect to run the football there. And that's part of the problem with the defense. In our league, if that's Reggie White on a tight end, they say, so long, uh, we're going someplace else uh, and going to run the football away from him. And, and the trick for us is to be able to take this guy, move him around some, and keep him involved in the game, obviously. Uh, and so that his position most of the time is a nine. Now, some things about uh, these alignments. Uh, as far as the nose tackle is concerned and his responsibilities. You know, if he's a zero, uh, he's going to knock him back. He's going to play the play side A gap. Uh, if pass uh, uh, shows he's an inside rusher away from the three technique, and, and he plays that way. Now, uh, if he is a, uh, in a zero strong technique now, again, it's all the same for him. And the only difference is in that position, he is really a backside a gap player and the mic is a front side a gap player unless we change it and he's got the responsibility of having to work up the field in that crack all the time regardless of where he is so if they try to scoop him in here and come off he can't get too hatted he's got to work up the field in that gap and the same is true when he's a nose player. We still want to do the same thing with him. We still have to be able to ensure that he's in that gap. And we don't get all paranoid about the fact that he may lose the front side gap because we think that's a logical inside adjustment for this guy, even though he's a backside gap player, that once his colored jersey appears, we just want it to appear up the field so that he's got a good downhill scrape angle to that gap. But again, it's all downhill and none of it's parallel uh, or across the top in those situations. Again, uh, when he's a backside A-gap player, any sort of block back, he's got to squeeze that gap and then maintain his own A-gap. Now, when we talk about the three-technique tackle, uh, again, we got the same thing going that we talked about before in terms of this guy uh, has to be a, in a position to be able to defeat this guy here, the, the offensive guard. And is always the case, whenever he's lined up in a gapped type position here with a wide shade, he's got to read inside and feel outside. Uh, that would be much the same as if in the 34 defense we were playing what we'd call 44, he's in a four technique. He is going to feel this and read this, always. Always read inside, feel outside. That's the way he's got to play. Because here's the ball. That ball, the person with the ball is the guy who can hurt him. So we don't want him looking out here. We want him keying and reading inside and always feeling anything that's going to occur uh, to him from the outside. And as we said, the things that 
that bother him the most are if people get bent on double pushing that and staying on it. Just push it right back in the linebacker. That's the toughest thing can happen to you in that defense. If people are physical enough to be able to do that and patient enough to do it, that's the toughest thing. Don't worry about blocking him. Just get behind him. I mean, that's what happened to us when we were in that five linebacker uh, eagle defense a lot. People just all of a sudden decide, hey, with the flow nose in there and a penetrating tackle, they were going to take the penetrating tackle away from you. And uh, that's what hurts that defense about as much as anything. So uh, anyway, uh, that sort of double team, uh, now your nose uh, in that situation has got to be a great player. You know, and he's got to be able to play the trap, and that's no problem from, from the inside. Uh, the double and then occasionally people will line up and try to get some kind of a wham on him either from the outside uh, in or from the inside out and he's got to be aware of all of those things that can happen to him. One thing about his position, as you look at the three technique tackle and you look at the rush lanes, here the tackle is rushing here in the over defense, the end is rushing here. They usually got to bring him out to do it if he's involved in a pattern to use a back. We like that about it. And the thing about the three technique that, that's got to happen though, is the draw is always a problem to a guy who thinks he's got a free rush up the field uh, in a passing game. And the thing that we tell this guy is, hey, you got to be square all the time. So that if you start your pass rush here, and this guy starts to turn to wheel you, think about your hand placement. That's all you got to think about. So that if uh, I'm that three technique rushing up the field and through the corner of that blocker, and he turns uh, to punch me up the field, then I just got to think about getting his right hand back on that inside number, which squares me up, squeezes the draw, and I'm in a position to be able to make that play. But he's got to think about that. And that's got to be a big part of how we teach that guy so that we don't put a, 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 an extraordinary burden on that nose tackle who is offset on that side of the formation. So uh, that's a crucial part of, of a three technique and what we're trying to get there. Now, uh, the strong end in the under defense. When we play him in that position, and we don't do it a lot, but if we get in a formation where there's no threat of strong side run, we may cheat him in that position, counting when we have backer force on that side for the strong safety to be a C-gap player. We think we can count on him a little bit better uh, in terms of picking him up on runs away uh, to the weak side of the formation in the C-gap than we can the B-gap, then we'll do that a little bit. But basically, most of the time, this guy is going to be a six technique player for us, and he's going to do all those same things we talked about. He's a C-gap player, runs away, he squeezes the B-gap to that side of the formation. He's outside pass rusher. Uh, and, the th and the thing about any kind of a down block from the Y, we expect that he's going to backdoor that again with the theory that we're going to play at the next level and that the Mike linebacker will have a good uh, angle downhill inside out to the football on that side of the formation. Uh, this guy, for us, uh, is a good player, obviously. That's Reggie White in that position. And the thing that we constantly are trying to do is to find ways to be able to keep him involved in the ball game more. And, and, and obviously, one of the things that we can do uh, is to play him closer to the ball. And we do that some with him. And he, he handles most of those tackles that he lines up over uh, in that situation. Now, uh, with our uh, strong end, uh, in the uh, or the flop backer if we're playing our over defense uh, with that nine technique we we like him pointed down at the tip of the shoulder and his angle is right through the outside shoulder uh, of that uh, defensive end I mean of, of the offensive tight end and what we're trying to do with him obviously is to say that you ignore everything that this guy does uh, except that if he tries to turn you out you squeeze we're not going to put him in force very much uh, except if we're in man dog or blitz we're going to try to have either a corner rolling up outside him or a strong safety coming up outside him so he can be a hard player a pass rusher from that position uh, and if people want to try to protect with a tight end on him we like that matchup most of the time most people don't and so uh, they will try to bring that tackle out or a back on him. We like that too. So there are lots of things about the passing game we like in terms of the rush with this guy. It's just that we're limited so much coverage-wise because of the alignment of that plugger uh, in that situation. Uh, 
if they get in any kind of a situation where they got a close wing in there, uh, whether we're talking about our buck linebacker or we're talking about our defensive end, we don't ever uh, bring this guy out over the top of him. We always play tough in the crack, and the read is always here, and it's always feel here. Uh, we want to play hard and aggressive up the field through that crack all the time. Again, whether it's the under defense with our buck linebacker there or with our defensive end there. And, and when, we, when we can get that done and maintain what we call the hard corner where we're pressuring up the field there, we're always a lot better football team. We try to stay away from situations and circumstances where we're in an eight or head up. Again, we don't want to get involved in all those easy block reads or is he reach blocking me or is he releasing. We would rather have this guy in this position where there isn't any question about the collision course there and, and what he's going to do in terms of a hard player. He's like our buck linebacker. Anytime he gets any kind of a down block, we expect him to play at the next level in the position normally occupied by the tackle so that he's forcing and closing that C gap in those situations. Okay, now, uh, in terms of our uh, weak side uh, of our defense, uh, the weekend and our under, uh, again, it's the same thing that we have talked about. We want him about a yard and a half outside, pointed in on the weak side. We want his aiming point to be the near hip or the near back. If he gets any kind of attack from the near back on his side the formation, we want him, we're going to be most of the time playing what we call again crash and scrape. So he's going to two gap him to inside arm control and now that backer is going to scrape to this side the formation and he plays it two ways. If we play in crash and scrape force, then he's the force guy. He's got to get everything inside him as he comes to this point. If we got a corner force and outside, then he's going to be an alley player or a cutback player uh, when he crashes and scrapes there. So we have two different ways that we play it. Uh, now, uh, in terms of the end force, if he is a force guy because we're in man, dog, or blitz, then he's going to come off the corner there, he's going to put everything on his inside pad, and he's going to compress it there uh, as deep as he can and still maintain uh, the, this lane on this side to formation. That is the lane between him and, and the three technique. Uh, in passes, he's all contained rush force. Now, when we are in situations uh, in the over defense with our defensive end here on this side to formation, we got some things we don't like about that, like I said, uh, from a physical standpoint there, the matchup with this guy over the top of the offensive tackle from a physical standpoint, and uh, obviously he's a two-gap player whenever he's a five on plays away from him. He's got to take that gap, and now uh, we got to hold him for any kind of a reverse in there, uh, whereas when he's an outside player and we got our whip linebacker stacked behind him on that side of the formation, then he becomes the backside B-gap player on plays away, and now he's the reverse player or the player up the field on the backside of the formation, okay? Uh, so uh, basically that's the way it looks for us uh, with our buck linebacker. With our Mike linebacker, our Mike linebacker is always a downhill player. There is no outside shuffle. He is always downhill, scribing the arc inside out to the ball. Any type of a lead or direct read play at him, uh, he is going to make it look like he's going to put it on his outside shoulder, go to a two gap, and then a win inside so that that ball is going to bounce out to our defensive end and our safety on that side of the formation. Uh, in the over defense, his reads and his, his responsibilities are always stay constant in terms of the offset nose or the two gap nose. Uh, he's a backside player. If, he, if the two gapper gets reached, then it's going to happen up the field and he's going to scrape it downhill. The uh, position, I think, that, that gets to be a, a little bit tough. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, responsibilities, in terms of the physical aspect of it, uh, it is the plugger, and that, that's over on the strong side, the formation, when he is involved here in that process of having to take a lineman on almost all the time off the down block and to pull around by the offensive guard. So uh, 
you know, when you start looking at putting defensive schemes together, there's a couple of things involved. I think you want to get as much variety in it as you can, but you want to stay as constant as you can with the techniques, the reads, and the keys uh, that, they, that you're teaching with them. So uh, that's essentially it. Uh, I, I think, Bob, we're going to, in a second here, uh, uh, open it up to questions and uh, take it from there, huh? Yes. Thank you very much, Fred. Okay.